start, I want to thank you all for showing up to the first virtual tour from the Associated Students of Venture Outings. My name is Riley Cox. I'm the Operations Assistant Coordinator. Um, and I want to preface this by saying I'm not a scientist or a geologist uh, or a wilderness ranger in the park, but I used to be uh, a backpacking guide in Yosemite National Park for three summers. So I've spent a ton of time here. I've talked to a ton of rangers in the area and this is kind of, what I'll share with you is the knowledge that I've gleaned over the years working in the park. Um, so we'll start here, if you can see my cur cursor on the west side and we're just gonna move east along the valley floor and finish our tour on the iconic Half Dome. So we'll get started here. All right, so this is the, the famous view. This is what people refer to as tunnel view. Um, as you, this is, if you're coming in from San Francisco, this is the first vista of the park you see, this crazy view with these towering walls. Um, and so before we really delve into the valley itself, I want to acknowledge that evidence shows um, that the native population, the Awanichi people lived here six to 8,000 years ago. So there is a ton of history here. We are but a blip on the timeline. The, the native peoples lived here and inhabited this region for a long, long time. So I'm gonna do my best to highlight names of things, native names of, of features in the park and do my best to kind of acknowledge them. So like I said, they were called the Awanichi and they named this valley Awani Valley. And Awani means Valley of the Big Gaping Mouth. So you can kind of picture that with these big walls you see here from this view. This is where they grew up, this is where they lived. So being surrounded by those big walls, you can see why they would refer to the valley as that. Um, and so if they called this valley Awani, why do we call it Yosemite? And that's because in 1851, you had a battalion track a band of natives into this valley. And it was the first time that the white man or European saw the valley. And that was in 1851. And they had been speaking with surrounding tribes and the surrounding tribes would refer to the Awanichi people as the Usamadi um, or some version of that. I'm probably not pronouncing that right at all and loosely it translated to Yosemite. And so the battalion of people thought, well, that's what they were called. But in reality, Yosemite was a fairly derogatory term, meaning the one who kills or the killer of grizzlies. And that's because the chief of the, of the people who lived here, Chief Tanaya, it was actually um, a tribe of like renegades and outlaws of sorts from various other tribes throughout the region who inhabited this area. And they were feared among the other tribes. And so they were called the, the Yosemite or the Yosemites, the ones who killed. So to start it off with that, I think it's a pretty interesting uh, historical fact. We should be calling this place like Owani National Park. I think it would be awesome if we could call it that or you know, the, the Valley of the Big Gaping Mouth. But um, throughout the tour, I'll have photos up here and I'll kind of work through them after a speech or something because I have to click on them to get them large and large. So this is a photo of an actual Awanichi. Um, they lived throughout the valley for a long time and they're still the descendants of the, the Awanichi in the valley today. The valley has like a designated zone for them. Um, and this is from the Yosemite online library archive. They have a ton of information, a lot of really cool photos. And this is another photo, sorry for the graininess, some of the photos will be grainy that come from the library website. This is a little bit later after some industrialization of the valley, but yeah, so we'll move on a little deeper. Feel free to put any questions in the chat. 
I'm probably going to be talking fast. So just throw them in there and Jenna will stop me when she, when she can. Um, all right. So this is a view right on the beautiful Merced river. And, um, if you can follow my cursor, there's actually the highway right here. This is the highway that you, that you drive to enter the park. So right here, we get the first waterfall that you see when you enter the park. And this is Bridal Veil Falls, um, 617 feet tall. It's pretty crazy. These waterfalls are absolutely massive in the valley. Anywhere else, a single waterfall would be the home of a, a state park or something like that. But they just dwarf so many waterfalls across the country. 617 feet tall. It's a year round waterfall. And it was in fact called Pohono Falls by the native peoples. Pohono meant spirit of the puffing wind. And uh, when I was working here, a ranger once told me that the native mothers would tell their children that an evil spirit inhabited the waterfall. And if they got too close to the base of the falls, the spirit would snatch, snatch them up and bring them to the top of the waterfall. Um, so I think that's a, a fun little wives tale or like a parenting 101 that the natives probably used to keep their kids out of danger while they were uh, exploring this area. Um, so like I said, 617 feet tall, you also get this great view of this feature, which to me looks like you know, maybe the maw of some giant bear. And so it's another reference to the Valley of the Gaping Mouth right here. Just a beautiful photo. Here's another view of Bridal Veil Falls with the leaning tower a feature that people climb right here off to the right. So this photo, I took um, right after a bunch of rainstorms. And so this is actually the trail to get to the base of the waterfall and the river is flooded and we're probably a quarter mile from the base of the waterfall and you can see how much mist is in the air. I actually couldn't get to the base because the, the trail was flooded and there was so much mist. And so I think it really highlights um, the name Pohono or spirit of the puffing wind and how crazy this waterfall can get when there's a lot of after a lot of rain so we also get a nice teaser of el capitan off in the distance as you drive along this road el cap is one of the main features you see right when you enter the valley in the park and so let's uh let's go take a closer look this is like one of my favorite things el capitan it always gets me excited if you've never driven into the valley, there's nothing quite like seeing El Cap in person for the first time. It is just an absolutely massive feature. So the natives called this feature uh, Tutakanula, um, and that loosely translated to Rock Chief. So like I said previously in 1851, when that battalion came in looking for the natives, they had a translator in their group. And so that translator, he couldn't really understand or pronounce the word for this rock feature. And so they named it El Capitan because they knew it loosely meant rock chief. And so the El Cap or El Capitan was their, their version of that. And so that's why we call it El Cap today or El Capitan. Um, so the feature is 3,000 vertical feet. It is the largest vertical face of granite in the world. Um, and it is over a mile and a half, a mile and a half long. It is just absolutely massive. It's, it's pretty hard to, under, or to overstate how big this feature is. And it's super colorful. There are over 16 different types of granite composition that make up El Cap. So any geology buffs out there, El Capitan is a crazy geological study. Um, how are we doing, Jenna? Any questions come in? I'm going to stop real quick before I dive into some climbing history. Yeah. Um, is there a possibility when you zoom out to give a reference of where Hetch Hetchy is? I know we're focused on 
Yosemite Valley, but it'd be. Um, I can do that right now for you. I will do that. Thanks. Okay, so we have the valley. That'll be where all the little blue dots are, right? And so Hetch Hetchy is gonna be right here. So honestly, it looks like almost directly north of the valley. I can zoom in on Hetch Hetchy, this big reservoir. So I'll be doing a tour next week as well called the Hidden Places of Yosemite and Hetch Hetchy will be on that tour. So if you wanna know more about Hetch Hetchy, tune in next week and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, I'm just gonna reorient myself here. Okay, so absolutely massive piece of granite, 3000 vertical feet. And what's that, what that's done really is that's created a world test piece for rock climbers. Obviously, this people come from all over the world to climb El Cap. It's been famous recently for the free solo by Alex Honnold. Um, but I don't think what, what most people don't know is it was first climbed in um, 1958 by a guy named Warren Harding. So here's this, this madman right here. His name was Warren Harding and he climbed it with his two partners, Wayne Mary and George Whitmore. So this was 1958 and it took him 40 days to climb to the top of El Cap. He didn't do that all at once. What he did was he set ropes. He like fixed ropes to the wall so that he could go up and down and gain more supplies. So he would stay on the wall for three, four, five days, slowly work up higher, come back down and get, for him, it was more booze. He was an alcoholic and he was known for drinking copious amounts of wine while he climbed. Um, I would not recommend that at all. So it took him 40 total days, but it was over the course of two years that he did this. So fast forward 36 years, 36 years later, it's 1993 and Elk Cap was free climb. So he's got all this gear and what he would do is he would use his gear to help him up the wall. So the next big thing was climbing El Capitan only using your hands and feet, and just having a rope to protect yourself with. And that's called free climbing. And the first person ever to free climb El Capitan in history was a woman named Lynn Hill. And this was done in 1993. She is regarded as one of the greatest rock climbers of all time. Just an absolute boss. Um, so this was in 1993. She came back a year later in 1994 and climbed it all free in a single day. First person ever to climb it in one day as well. So I got a poll for you guys. Just curious, while you guys are answering this poll, I'm just gonna take a look in the chat. For anyone new who's joined in, thanks for joining. I see it says share and you're saying that photos are not showing properly. Are they like not loading for you? Uh, I, I can speak for that. Like you can see half of the photo or part of the photo and not all of it. Oh, oh, that's unfortunate. I'm not really sure why. Yeah, I'm not really sure why. It's not on all the photos. It's only on the black and white so far. Okay. The people climbing. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Well, I apologize about that. Um, that's something I'll have to fix for the next one. Thanks for the feedback. Most people have answered. So for you guys to see a lot, the, the most people thinks it, it takes two days for the average fit climbing team to climb El Capitan. It's a pretty good guess. It's, it's more like four days. Um, it takes four days for the fit team of two to climb El Capitan. Lynn Hill did it in one, first person ever. And then we have 
Oh, I always gotta. So here's the route. For those curious, this is the route that she climbed up the wall. And then you have this climbing pair. You have Tommy Caldwell and Alex Honnold. And in 2018, 24 years after Lynn Hill climbed it in a day, they set the speed record. They climbed it in one hour and 58 minutes, which is just like absolutely bonkers. Um, they were basically running for 3,000 vertical feet. In my opinion, and, and this guy right here, he's also the one who free soloed El Capitan recently. So in my opinion, some of the two of the the greatest feats of, of human athleticism by these two guys right there. It's, um, it's absolutely absurd. So I'm gonna come back and I wanna highlight real quick, right here in the middle, um, and I hope you guys can see this full picture. Is it showing up all the way? No, more, more now. <laughs> okay. Um, right here, you see there's a, a spot where you have to traverse um, along this route. You have to move over to the left. And this is actually a mandatory pendulum swing on the nose of El Capitan, this route. And it's called the King Swing. And so I wanted to show you guys a video of this just to stick show you guys how crazy these climbers actually are. I have to fast forward here. Riley, can you move it over a little bit to the left? There you go. Now we can get it. Ha. So I hope you guys could see that. It's a mandatory massive pendulum swing over a thousand feet in the air. And so I want you guys to focus on the size of these people up here on the top of this big boot shaped flake see how small they are and what i'm going to do so i'm going to zoom out and i can actually zoom in to el capitan and you can see the boot flake right here so think about this oops look how high that flake is off the ground and those people are pendulum swinging along the rock that high up it's absolutely bonkers. Um, but yeah, just one. I think that's like one of the coolest things about climbing El Capitan that not many people know about. So I just wanted to highlight that. But I'm also going to move on because I've always I, I talk too much about about uh, El Cap. All right, so we're going to move east again, and this time we're going to stop right here at the start of the lower falls loop trail and this will take this trail would take you to the base of the lower yosemite falls there's a bridge here and it like miss you and everything is pretty cool if i turn around there's like a bathroom here and there's a bus stop right here for the free bus shuttle in yosemite it's a pretty like nondescript place to stop at but what most people don't know is that just behind these trees was the site of the one of the largest Awanichi villages in Yosemite. So this was like the hub of Awanichi life. Um, and unlike the nomadic plains tribes of like the Midwest who built teepees who were nomadic, the Awanichi, they built more permanent housing structures called bark houses. Um, apologize for the graininess again, but these houses were built from the bark of cedar trees. And there just so happens to be a cedar tree right in front of me. It's this one right here. And after it has died and fallen and dried out a bit, this bark actually comes off in long strips and it makes quite nice uh, thatching for, for uh, roofs. Um, so as a hub of life here, the 
Awanichi were also prolific traders. Um, so they would trade a lot of things. They would trade black oak acorns, which was also their staple food source. And they would also trade baskets. So they were known for being master basket weavers. So here's an actual photo of one weaving their basket. And they would trade with tribes in the north and the south and the east. But I think one of the coolest things they would trade for was obsidian. And that was from the eastern tribes over by Mono Lake um, and like Lee Vining in that area. And uh, so they would trade their baskets or their acorn for obsidian. So if you're ever in Yosemite Valley and you find obsidian, just know that it is not native to the valley. Like someone else brought it there thousands of thousand years ago or whatnot. Um, so it is it's super cool find if you find obsidian in the valley. The other thing I wanna highlight in this area is this boulder right here. Just a random boulder in the valley, right? Not really. Um, this is one of the coolest things that you can find in the valley and everyone walks right past it. And it's cool because on top of that boulder are about 30 grinding holes. This, that boulder is where the women of the tribe would sit and grind black oak acorns um, for meal, for meal and uh, for food. So it's kind of like a, a spot where they would probably sit on a daily basis for a couple hours and, and work. And uh, a fun fact I just recently learned, there was a study done in 2008 by the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, and they wanted to know how long it would take to, to make a hole like this in granite. And they concluded that it would take eight hours of continuous pounding over 67,000 strikes to make a hole three and a half centimeters deep, which is about the size of a grape. So it would take eight hours of continuous pounding to make a grape sized hole. So looking at all these grinding holes, over 30 of them, some of them are like five, six inches deep. You know, you're looking at years and years and years of work of living in this area. And everyone walks right by this rock. You kind of have to climb up onto it. It's not like a super low one. Plus, I mean, look at the view they had. They chose quite a quite an awesome spot to set up their kitchen, a view of the Yosemite Falls. So this is the, the iconic Yosemite Falls, upper, middle, and lower. It's actually three waterfalls. Um, 2,425 feet tall if you combine all three. It's one of the largest in North America. The first fall, the tallest one, is um, 1,430 feet, 1,430 feet tall. I'm gonna show you just a, a beautiful photo of the, the waterfall there. This is taken from the, the trail that takes you to the top of this waterfall. You can actually get on top. There are swimming holes up there you can swim in um, when it's low water, it's pretty wild. Beautiful view of Half Dome in the distance with some alpine glow hitting it. And then one of the coolest things about this waterfall, not only does it dry up completely in the summer, but in the winter, the mist from the waterfall freezes before it hits the ground and it creates a giant snow cone at the base of the waterfall. So highly recommend coming to Yosemite in the winter and checking out the giant snow cone. I think the record is 119 feet tall, was the size of the snow cone at the bottom of this waterfall. Just a pretty cool fun fact there. All right, we're moving on. Whoops, accidentally stopped the, the flow. All right, so we've landed in Stoneman's Meadow. Stoneman's, Stoneman's Meadow is pretty much in the heart of Yosemite Valley, um, surrounded by the towering walls, a beautiful area. 
right here through the trees is half dome so you can't quite see it but it is sitting right behind those trees and then right through this grove of trees is a big parking lot a big free parking lot so pro tip if you are ever going to yosemite get there early and park in this parking lot because right here is a bus stop and this is a free shuttle it takes you anywhere in the valley you want to go so you can park your car here for free and take the shuttles all over yosemite you don't have to worry about parking the whole day but you have to get here early um so obviously there's been a lot of industrialization of yosemite valley um and this started very quickly after 1851 and those first white european settlers came in to the area um, people started coming in logging and trapping and um, looking for a way to make money and so in 1864 president lincoln signed the yosemite grant and this was a landmark legislation this was the this put yosemite valley and the giant grove the mariposa grove of giant sequoias in the south under state protection so yosemite was the first state protected park in, in our country's history. And then he immediately pushed it to the federal government to be protected because they didn't want it anymore. Um, they thought it was a little too much to handle. And so that was good. It was a good thing that they protected the park because of the industrialization. And shortly thereafter, and I think this is because this is just outside of the park boundaries, but right up here on top of this point called Glacier Point was a hotel. And that hotel was built in 1872, only what, 21 years after the first person ever found the park. So 21 years later, you have a hotel built. This was called the Glacier Point Mountain House. Here's an actual photo of it. And because it sat just up on the rim of the valley, I think it was allowed to be built up here, even though it was under state protection. So the owner, um, it was owned by the McCauley family and they would build a big bonfire for their guests every night. And at the end of the night, when the bonfire died down and it was just ash and coals, they would push it off, they would push it off the, the canyon wall. Like I don't really understand why they thought it was a good idea to push flaming ember off the side of a 3,000 foot tall cliff. Um, but what it ended up creating was the spectacle known as the firefall. Um, this is the best photo I could find of it. This is from a long time ago. But the burning ash would create a waterfall of fire, basically. And it turned into a massive hit. So the firefall ran every night for almost a hundred years. And this whole meadow that we're in right now, the Stone Men's Meadow, this would be filled with people. And there would be a fire master, isn't it? They called him the fire master up on top of Glacier Point. And he would yell down, Curry Village, are you ready? And then everyone down below, they would yell, let the fire fall. And they would push the embers off creating this big spectacle of, of falling fire. Um, it wasn't until, so 100 years later, around the 1970s, that it stopped. The new superintendent of the park realized it was a terrible idea to push flaming embers off the side of a cliff. And then shortly after thereafter, the hotel burnt down. Um, so that was kind of ironic. But then they never rebuilt it. Now it's a gift shop up there. Um, Glacier Point is also famous for this pointy little rock that you can see my cursor on right here. So this rock is the site of the famous photo with John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt right here. They're standing on that point. So I said in 1864, Lincoln um protected yosemite valley and the grove of giant sequoias um and i messed up he didn't quite put it under federal protection yet that happened later i apologize for that um in 1890 yosemite um in 1890 
the surrounding areas of Yosemite became a national park. But because Yosemite Valley itself and the grove were already protected, it wasn't included in that designation of a national park. So it was at that point being managed by two different entities. And John Muir, the, um, the famous naturalist and environmentalist of the day, didn't think that was a good idea at all. He was really worried about Yosemite Valley being misused. Um, and so he invited then President Teddy Roosevelt on a three-day backpacking trip. And so just think about a president going on a backpacking trip. Um, pretty wild in this day and age. I don't think that would ever happen right now. But Teddy went and John Muir spent three days convincing him to protect Yosemite. And then shortly thereafter in 1906, Roosevelt included Yosemite Valley and the Grove into the National Park. So all of Yosemite National Park was actually the third national park, um, even though it was the first state park ever created. Yellowstone was the first national park created in 1872. Lastly, um, people used to do wild things up there on Glacier Point, and uh, this photo was, I think, like a advertisement maybe for a car or something but these uh crazy men uh drove this car and parked it up on this this rock three thousand feet above the valley floor um highly illegal today highly illegal you're not even allowed to walk out on this rock anymore but you know back in the wild days i suppose all right so Moving on, we're gonna work way on out, take a little break from the valley itself, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how the whole Sierra was formed. So like, what caused this beautiful valley that we can go visit to even be here? So the short little video, take us back to junior high earth science. Harley, can you move the video so that it fits in the screen a little bit better? I don't know how to do that. Is it better if it's just like this? Uh, it's a little bit far to the right. Okay. Well, I apologize about that. Um, I wasn't. I didn't realize that these videos were slightly off. Uh, in the chat, it says you have to have Zoom in full screen as a viewer. Aha. Okay. So maybe that's why I popped it to full screen, but everyone else has to do the same. Uh, well, if you can't catch the video, basically what it's saying is that you have an oceanic plate Pacific on the Pacific Ocean colliding with the, the continental plate of North America and it sinks underneath. And when it does that, it melts and creates massive pools of magma that basically float towards the surface, creating volcanoes. Um, so some create volcanoes and some don't. And the ones that don't, all of that magma hardens under the surface. So if you look out at this vista, basically everything that looks like snowy mountains it all used to be pools of magma under the surface and hardened and through tectonic action was then lifted back up. So this lake on the left is called Mono Lake and this is the Mono Basin. There's actually a fault line right here and the Sierra Nevada mountains are unique because it fractured along this fault line and tilted. So usually mountains just form making this A, they get formed by getting pushed up in the middle, but the Sierra Nevadas broke and tilted, which is why the east side is really steep, and this west side is sloping gently. Um, and so it formed all of these 
crazy mountains right here. And then if we zoom back in, so I like to think of this tectonic action and getting pushed up from underneath the surface as laying the foundation. And then glaciers came through and polished and worked the landscape into what we see today. So are these photos also off center, Jenna? They look better now that I'm in full screen mode and other folks might be feeling the same way. Okay. So this, and I apologize for the graininess. This is from the Yosemite Library's website. All of their photos are like this. Um, this is a recreation of what the valley looked like, um, you know, millions of years ago from the National Park Service. And so their thought is that the valley just looked like this, rolling gentle hills with the river meandering through. Um, the Merced River was actually here before all of the mountains that we see today. So it is ancient. Um, and then as those pools of magma that have hardened, get pushed up towards the surface, they start revealing themselves, like you see in this photo. And then over time, they become more pronounced and that river starts carving deeper and deeper and deeper into this valley, making a valley. Um, and so one thing about glaciers is glaciers form U-shaped valleys and rivers form deep V-shaped gorges and valleys. And so in this photo, you can see a nice V shape, really deep, really steep. Um, and then an ice age hit. And this was filled with ice. So they estimate that only the top of Half Dome was left like open. Um, you can think of a 3,000 foot thick ice cube just like sitting in the valley, moving back and forth. Um, Glaciers ebb and flow, they move, and as they move, they pick up debris and rocks, and it creates sandpaper, and it carves and polishes out, reworking the landscape. It's, what, like the most powerful erosive force on the planet? And so I have another little video. So if anyone, everyone wants to like flip to, uh, to the full screen here, hopefully you all can see this. This is a recreation that someone made of what the glaciation would have looked like in the Sierra Nevadas over 30,000 years. Um, and what you guys were going to want to focus on is this area right here my cursor is on is Yosemite Valley proper. I think it does a great job illustrating the ebb and flow of glaciers and how far reaching they can be. And then unfortunately, today we, we don't have any left. Um, I believe the last glacier in Yosemite was downgraded to a snowfield in 2017, the Lyle Glacier. So we're losing our glaciers in Yosemite, but a uh, pretty incredible force here. So this was all carved out by glaciers. I think right here is a great example of that U shape that you can see here. Um, and all of this along clouds rest was polished as well. Okay, we've made it to the most iconic feature, uh, half dome. The Native American or the Albanese word for half dome is Tisiak. And in the Native American legend, Tisiak was actually a real person. It was a female, so half dome is female. Um, and 
she was turned to stone by their gods because her and her husband were having this like massive fight and being super vicious to each other. And uh, the gods didn't like that. So they turned them, they, it, they turned them both to stone so they could forever look at each other. Um, if I zoom out a little and rotate, This is the husband. North Dome and Washington Column is the husband and Half Dome is the female. So they're for, forever staring at each other is the legend. They were like beating each other and fighting and all this stuff. Um, but there is a, a creation story for almost all of the geological features. Some are super complicated and uh, kind of crazy, but if anyone's interested, look up the creation story for El Capitan. That one is really cool. Um, so I have a poll, the last poll. So I'm gonna launch that and just bring up this beautiful photo of Half Dome while that poll is going. I'm gonna take a second to check the chat as well. So I'm just scrolling up in chat. Um, Logan, you are right. The U.S. Calvary did manage the park in that interim period before it was create before it was designated as a national park, and that was the Buffalo Soldiers. That was an all-black regiment that managed the national park and set the standard and the foundation for current-day park rangers. Um, the Buffalo Soldiers, an all-black regiment, that's a pretty cool fact there. Thanks for that, Logan. Um, I see someone mentioning the firefall. So I mentioned the lesser known one, the firefall coming off of Glacier Point, but there's also the firefall off of El Capitan that Jenna mentioned called off Horsetail Falls, that waterfall that only shows up in February. Um, people will camp out in the valley for like a month trying to get a photo of that. Okay, wow, we have quite the spread here. So we got five people who have already climbed Half Tone. That's awesome. Super awesome. Yeah, it's quite the experience. Um, most of you guys, it's a life goal. It can be scary but you just gotta keep your mind with you and, and you'll do fine for those who think it looks scary. So for the rest of this tour, for the next uh, 12 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about what it takes to get to the top of Half Dome. For all of those, for all of you guys who want to climb Half Dome, um, this will be the, the, uh, the how-to. Okay, so the Half Dome Trail is eight to nine miles long, depending on where you start. And that is from the valley floor all the way to the top of Half Dome. It's about eight, eight and a half miles, 4,800 feet of elevation gain. If you are doing it in a single day, because that's what your permit is for, it's a doozy. It's definitely a doozy. You're looking at 16 plus miles, 5,000 feet up, 5,000 down. It takes the average person 12 to 15 hours to hike it in a single day. Um, but you are, everyone is more than capable of doing it. I have gotten, I have taken a 72 year old who was training for it. It was his goal and we did half them together in a day. Um, so it took us 15 hours, but, but he did it. And uh, I just say that to say, if it's your goal, you can do it. Um, so as you work your way up through the canyon, you're gonna pass two spectacular features. There are two waterfalls, 
The first one is called Vernal Falls. And if I zoom in, see it peeking out right there. Oops. And the second one is Nevada Fall, and it's about a mile and a half above Vernal Fall. And so this section of trail to the two waterfalls is called the Mist Trail. It is the most popular trail in the entire park, hands down. If you try and get on this trail in the summer at like 10 in the afternoon or 10 in the morning, there will be hundreds of people on this trail. It's, it's quite ridiculous. Go early or go in the evening if you want to hike this trail. It's about two miles to the first waterfall, three and a half to the second. Absolutely stunning. It's called the mist trail because the waterfall, the power of this waterfall is so strong, it blows mist all the way down the canyon and all along the trail. So here's a photo of the mist trail. I'm wearing a rain jacket because, well, it's basically raining on me on this trail. And the beautiful thing about it We'll go to the next one so you can see the waterfall. The beautiful thing is the way the sun shines through this canyon, it is like perpetually filled with rainbows. I have never seen more rainbows in my life than in this canyon. It's absolutely stunning. About a mile and a half above this, you hit the second waterfall, and this one's called Nevada Fall. The first one is 416 feet tall. The big brother here is 594 feet tall. It's quite massive. And the trail will take you up this left side. You can't quite see it. You have to like climb these switchback stairs all the way up the gully. But you can actually get on top of this waterfall. And right here, there's a small little railing. And you can look over the edge. And the view is quite spectacular. And again, more rainbows. If you want to see a rainbow, hike the mist trail. You will not be disappointed. Lastly, for those who know about the John Muir Trail, the famous trail from Yosemite Valley to Mount Whitney, um, the, the um, proper way to do that is to hike the John Muir section. And the John Muir section takes you along this wall right here. And here's a view from the John Muir Trail. So you have Nevada Fall, you have Liberty Cap, Mount Broderick, and this big guy is actually the back of Half Dome. Um, not a, a view most people see the backside of it. <laughs> Bonus points for anyone in the chat who can name this flower right here. Okay. Indian so you have a brush. real what? Indian paintbrush. Indian paintbrush. All right. Yeah. You guys got it. So they call it that because the natives actually used to paint with it. They used the tip of the head as like a paintbrush. I'm just kidding. I don't know that. Um, but, it, but it sounds like they would do that, right? Sounds like a good name. Uh, so the first two and a half miles, three, I'm sorry, the first three and a half miles of your hike to the two half dome, really exhilarating, a lot to see. You have two major waterfalls. Um, but then you hit a slog, not gonna lie. You, you uh, have to put your head down and hike for a while. You have about a mile of flat ground and then three and a half miles uphill through the forest to get to the base of Subdome. So we'll go to the base of Subdome now. This is just forest hiking. It's beautiful, but it's nothing like those waterfalls. Um, so after all of that, all that uphill, you get to the base of Subdome. Now Subdome, most people don't realize, is the little, it's like the right shoulder of actual Half Dome. And in my opinion, it is the physical crux. It's the most challenging part. You can actually see the stairs cut into the side of this cliff face right here. I think it's about a quarter mile uphill, just punches straight up. We'll take a closer look. And I show you guys all of this not to dissuade you. I want to reiterate 
that if it is your goal, you can do this. Um, I have seen every age, shape, and size make it to the top of Half Dome. Um, it's more about your willpower and your determination to do it than it is your physical capabilities. So this is a view from the subdome proper, actual just steps cut into the side of this rock right here. Pretty wild. Um, but you are distracted by these just ridiculous views, 360 views of majesty around you. One of my favorite views in the whole park. <laughs> So real quick, before we get to the cables and to the top, I do want to go one slide back and pause it. And um, so that, that uh, eight miles and 4,800 feet up, that's if you're doing it in one day. So a lot of people, that is too much for them, right? That is a 16 mile day with all the elevation gain is a lot. So you don't have to do that. Right here, right at the base of this little rock formation, there is a huge campground with a pit toilet right by the river. The river has a huge section of beach. It's like actual beach sand. It's pretty phenomenal. And so what a lot of people do is they'll hike up here. It's about three and a half, four miles. So it's about halfway and they set up camp and then they wake up the next day and they hike to the top of half dome and then they come back down and camp another night if they want to um so you can definitely take the chill scenic way up to the top of half dome you don't have to do it in a single day i've done both and i will say it's a doozy to do in a day it is <laughs> yeah if you can get the campground do it that way um all right, so you finally make it to the top of Subdome. And you're right about you're right about here. So here's a photo. This was a backpacking trip I led. Um, a mother and son decided not to go to the top. And so I stayed behind while my co-guide took the rest of the group up top. And uh, like true guiding fashion, we decided to make dinner up here because why not? I mean, got to enjoy that view. And it looks like it was fajita night. Um, so making fajitas on Subdome, it's pretty stellar. But you could see the cables behind. That is the iconic cable route up to the top. So let's, let's take a closer look at the cables. We're nearing the end here. Hold on one sec, sorry, it's crazy to think that you have Google Earth Street View on the cables, but you do. Hey, Riley. Yep. A question in the chat from Mallory. Okay. Do you think that going up the steps on Subdome is more nerve wracking than the cables? No. And that's not my personal opinion. So I've taken clients up Half Dome 22 times. And in my experience, by asking, by doing this so much and every time asking uh, the people I was with, like how was their experience, the cables are more nerve wracking mentally, but Subdome is physically harder. That was the general consensus. I mean, yes, it goes both ways, but the consensus overall was cables is a mental challenge and the and subdome is the physical challenge. It's a good question. So try and wrap this up. We're hitting about seven o'clock here. I apologize. We're gonna go a couple minutes over. Um, so in 1868, Josiah Whitney, Josiah Whitney was the head of the California State Geological Society at the time. He was the, the big wig geologist. And when he came in to do a survey of Yosemite National Park, he saw Half Dome and he said this quote. Um, he said, never has been and never will be trodden by human feet. 
referring to, to Half Dome. Seven years later in 1875, George Anderson climbed to the top of Half Dome. He should have known you never say a line like that, right? Like it will always be, be trumped. Uh, and what I think is fascinating is you can actually, so this is the OG route. This is the cable route is the route that George Anderson took to the top of Half Dome. And he would hand drill a hole in the rock and put a stake in it and stand on that stake and hand drill another hole. And you can actually see his small drill holes still in the rock today as you climb Half Dome. So this is a very historic route. Um, the current cables that you see, they're about, you have these wooden slats and they're about 15, 12 to 15 feet apart. I think there are, I think that's 60 of them, but the whole cable route itself is 400 feet long. Um, and so after everything you've done to get up here, you have 400 more feet to the top and that's it. You just have to climb the cables. So they, if it looks steep, it's because it is. It is pretty steep, uh, but it's very secure. Like I said, kids do this. I've taken um, every weight and size up here. If you are really scared, you can wear a harness with two like claws and you can clip yourself in so that you're safe. Um, Slow and steady wins the race for this one. Do we have any questions about the cables real quick before I move on? Haley? Kelly has a question. No, actually we both have the question. Do you go up and down the same cables? Like if you're going up, will people be coming down at the same time? That's a great question. Yes, you do. Um, so you just, you, you pass on those wooden slats and you stand to the side and you wait for someone to come down to where you are or you go up to where someone is. Communication and key, you never wanna pass like mid slat on that granite because thousands and thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people have climbed this and this granite path has been polished by boots. So it can be slippery. So you want to make sure you're wearing good hiking boots with good tread. Um, don't make the mistake of going up there and like running shoes with soft foam soles. You're going to be slipping all over the place. So good solid boots with good tread, slow and steady in communication, staying focused and, and you'll make it to the top. I have another question. So like, can you, for example, go up the cable route and then can you like go down like the rock steps or do you have to go use the cable like twice up and up and back you have to use the cables up and back because those rock steps are actually below you you have to hike those uh, just to get to the cables it's like a tiered set right you have the rock steps and then you have the cables okay yeah that's a good question all right so last but not least the last slide of the day uh, thank you guys for bearing with me we have the top the top of half dome um, an absolutely beautiful view can all just take a second to look at the the awesomeness of this view. The valley floor sits at 4,000 feet in elevation and the top of Half Dome is 8,836. So you are almost a mile above the valley floor when you're on the top of Half Dome. It's pretty wild and you get a 360 view of just everything. Like you have the valley proper, this is El Capitan off in the distance. Um, North Dome, Basket Dome, Mount Hoffman way back here, which is about 1400 feet taller. Mount Watkins right here. You have like, you can see all the way into the high country, Tanaya Peak, Echo Peak and Cathedral Peak. Um, the tallest peak in the whole park, Mount Lyle, is one of these little triangles over here. I don't know which one it is, but it's one of them. Uh, Mount Clark, this mountain is my favorite mountain in the whole park. That one sits right there. 
they're having a good time. All right, so we're on top of Half Dome. I have to talk about my personal favorite spot up here. And it's this cave right here on the edge. This is called the King's Throne. And so this is a photo of me and my, my good friend in the King's Throne on sunset, sticking our feet out over the edge. Um, would not recommend doing this if you're afraid of heights, but it is actually quite secure. It is way safer than it looks. I wouldn't just recommend that anyone, I wouldn't recommend this if it wasn't safe. Um, so you can hang your feet over the edge. And the reason it's my favorite spot is because it is the only place on top of Half Dome where you have an unobstructed view 2,000 feet straight down the face to the bottom, the base of the face of Half Dome. Anywhere else you look over the edge and you're gonna see ledges blocking your view. This is the only view on Half Dome where you can see all the way down to the base. And lastly, here's a view at sunset. Um, if you can manage it, climb Half Dome for sunset or for sunrise. It's some of the best, it's the best place you can possibly be for a sunrise or a sunset. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and if anyone else wants more information or beta on doing that, um, contact me. You can, uh, let's see, I'll put my work email in the chat. That's my work email. If anyone has any questions about Yosemite, if you guys are planning, if anyone's planning a trip there and wants some information on what they should do, where they should go, uh, hit me up. I love talking about it. It's, Yosemite is like my favorite place in the world. I've spent a lot of time there um, and I can fill you in and on all the little pro tips and tricks. With that, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was awesome to see so many people. I am doing a tour next week. This was like a general tour on Yosemite Valley, but Yosemite is, is this big and the whole park is like this big. It's huge. Yosemite National Park is 1,100 square miles. And so next week, I want to highlight a few of those amazing places in the rest of the park that people don't really go to because everyone comes to the valley. Um, so next week's tour is called Hidden Yosemite. It'll be six o'clock on Tuesday, same time. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, I'm glad you guys were enjoying it and I'll see you next time.